as I was reading this passage of scripture and I was considering it, don't ask me why. Maybe it's because one of my favorite movies, I don't know. Uh, I was thinking about this movie called The Miracle, and it's about a real event of the U.S. Olympic team, 1980, Winter Olympics, uh, the USA taking on the Russians, the Soviet Union, actually, at that point. And um, it is a great movie. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to watch it. I think I've used this a second time as a sermon illustration, but I just like it so much. What can I say? Uh, the the but the amazing thing about the story is is about uh, his name was uh, Kirk Russell who played Herb Brooks and he's creating his team the people who he would lead like we were talking about Jesus was leading the team and when when Herb Brooks was choosing his team he didn't choose it the way they normally did which was to take the superstars of all the college teams to bring them over to make a liberty to win. And Herb Brooks says, we can't do it that way. We've done it. We failed. We failed. The Soviets are too good. We have to rethink our whole approach to team making. And so he ends up bringing all these college around 80 or so students come up. On the first day of practice, he's already eliminated them to 26 players that he wants. And his, his assistant coach is like, what are you doing? Why are you choosing these 26? They're not even the best players. Why would you choose these ones? And as he would explain to his assistant coach, he's like, I'm not looking for the best I'm player. I'm looking for the best team. He's going to look at certain characteristics that people would ignore, things that people were not noticing, and he would choose people that he saw would make them a winning team. And one of the things that he would ask his teammates, his, his, his the, the team, everyone says like, What's your name, where are you from, and who you play for? And they would say their name, where they're from, and whenever they get to who you play for, they would say, maybe University of Michigan or University of Boston. And that was not the answer he was looking for until one fateful night after he's been really training them, one of the teammates, um, and his name was, uh, let's see, Mike. Here's him, well, when he, he asks, he finally gets that question, he says, my name is Mike, I'm from this one town, and I play for Team USA, United States of America. And that's the answer he's been looking the whole time. Who you play for? You don't play for yourself, you don't play for your old university, you play for this team. And they would go on to win the, the uh, hockey team between the Soviet Union it would be a great upset. But he created it by creating a team, a unique team that no one thought would be possible. Now, why do I think about this when I think about Jesus? Because when you look at the story of Jesus, who does he choose as his disciples? Does he choose the religious champions? Does he choose those in the Sanhedrin? Does he choose those are Pharisees or Sadducees or the zealots per se? He, he doesn't choose anyone that people would naturally choose. He chooses fishermen. He chooses tax collectors. He chooses these religious, one religious zealots. He chooses people that you would never think of. And the reason is, is like Herb Brooks, he was looking for special disciples. 12 disciples that when Jesus went and died and went up to heaven could carry his message forward. And so he chose specific people with specific qualities. And today, as we continue our series in the Son of God and the Gospel of John, we're going to look at the followers of Christ in John 1, 35 through 51. And what are the characteristics that we see that the disciples had, and these characters that these disciples has, these attitude disciples have, are just something that we should see to cultivate in our lives. Because the attitude that these disciples had were qualities that turned the world upside down and turned a pagan world into a Christian empire. We'll look at four things. The authentic faith, the devoted faith, 
the sharing faith and the pure faith, authentic, devoted, sharing, and pure. These qualities would define these disciples, not just these qualities, but others as well. But as you look at these specific ones, these are qualities you see in their walk, in their faith with Christ. So let's look at the first one, authentic faith. Now I do realize we're covering a large passage of scripture. So to some degree, we're going to run through it. We're going to pick up some sort of highlights. I encourage you later on, read the passage yourself, slowly read for it. You'll see certain details but we're gonna run through it uh, so we can finish on time. So authentic faith, starting in verse 35 again, it says, on the next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. Now, remember this is the, the previous day, John has said the Lamb of God takes away uh, sins sin of the world, he pointed out, and now he sees Jesus a second day, going by him again and declare again, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And so this is, Another day, it's like the, the fourth day that we see this transpired as the days have gone by. And the two disciples, we know one is Andrew. A lot of experts believe the next one was John. John also is often, he writes himself silent in his gospel. Account. But most people agree the second disciple here is John. But then in verse 36, it says, he looked at Jesus as he walked and he, uh, they, he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Who is that? That was the, John the Baptist, the Lamb of God. Now, one of the things that you, some degree, with what John the Baptist is saying here, is what he's been saying is, he has come to prepare the way of the Lord. John, Andrew, pay attention. That's the Lamb of God. This whole time, the whole thing, I've been preparing the way for him. It is not about me. There he is, and to some degree, he's given his disciples, Andrew and John, permission to go follow Jesus. Because ultimately, it was not about him, it was about Jesus. And so he allows them freely, if you want to follow him, go. He's the one you've been looking for. Then he goes on, verse 37 to 39, then he says, And the two disciples heard him speaking, following Jesus. And Jesus turned around and noticed them following, and he said to them, What do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and he stayed with them that day, and it was about the tenth hour. Now here we see these two men, Andrew and most likely John, with authentic faith. They want to know who Jesus is. They're going to pursue Jesus. When John says that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they don't ask questions. They don't debate. They don't say, let's have a committee and see where John is right. Let's, let's re when they hear God's message, when they hear God's word, they say, Let, they respond. And to some degree, what they respond in authentic faith is like that. We, when we hear God's word, when we hear the word preach, when we hear God's word, we should take action. We don't debate it. We don't form committees. We take action like John and Andrew do here. And when Jesus turns around and says, what do you seek? To some degree, it's a test. It's a question. He said, what do you really want? What are you looking for? What do you expect me to be? Do you expect me to be a miracle worker? Or do you expect me to be a, a, a zealot who's going to conquer over Rome? Do you think I'm just going to be a religious person? Who, to some degree, as, as later on he would ask Peter, who do you say I am? What are you looking for? And that's something we all need to ask us. When we turn to Jesus, when we're looking at Jesus, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a God that you want? Do you looking for a God that fills your expectation? Or are you looking for a God that you will follow and investigate and understand who he reveals himself to be and not who you reveal him to be? And so that's why when he says, what do you seek? And they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? What they're saying is, we are seeking for you and you alone. And that's the attitude we should have. We should seek Jesus for him 
and for his sake alone. And, and, and when he say rabbi, it means teacher, not just teacher, but a, 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 almost like we will follow you. If you remember, a, a rabbi disciple relationship was, and they're kind of describing this, they would follow quite literally the rabbi said. So if the rabbi walked straight down that doorway, they walked straight down that door. If the rabbi went through that doorway, they would go that way. Wherever the rabbi ate, that's what they would eat. Wherever they stayed, they would stay. And so they're saying, we realize you're a rabbi, you're the teacher, we want to follow your ways. And so you can see, they want Jesus for Jesus' sake alone. And that's how we should approach Jesus. We should not try to form Jesus into our own machinations, our own ideas, our own preferences, the only thing that, that makes us feel good. No, we follow Jesus for who he reveals himself in Scripture. And it's interesting that mentions that it was about the 10th hour. For a Jewish calendar or, or, or clock, most likely the 10th hour was 4 p.m. In other words, at 4 p.m., what are you supposed to do? Don't be going home, maybe give the wife a little kiss, maybe get some shut-eye, get ready for bed. No, instead of doing that, they're so committed to Jesus, instead of going to bed, instead of going home, they said, no, Jesus, we want to stay with you. And, and to some degree, it implies they stay with him the rest of the day, maybe even spent the night wherever he spent the night. That is a committed, authentic faith that we need to have. Do you have that kind of authentic faith? Or do you compromise your faith with your own ideas? Beloved, God is looking for authentic faith that wants Christ and Christ alone for who he is. Authentic faith wants Jesus for Jesus' sake. Authentic faith follows him wherever he goes. It says, when I run to difficult passages in the scripture, I don't try to ignore them. I don't try to make exceptions. I say, that's what God's word says. I may not like it, but that's what God's word, are, God's word says, so I accept it the way it is. Authentic faith is a faith that believes and trusts in the Lord despite uh, your own preferences. Authentic faith is a transformed faith, but it's more than authentic faith because it then goes on to the next thing is a devoted faith that we see in Peter here. And uh, starting in verse 40, it says, one of the two who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Interesting enough that despite becoming a follower of Jesus first, is actually Andrew would eventually become a tertiary compared to his brother Peter, who would become first foremost. But we'll see why. One of the reasons why I think he comes foremost is there's something special about Peter. 41 says he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translate Christ. Now, as you can see, Peter and Andrew are brothers. It would be maybe made clear later, they are both fishermen. And the word Christ is mentioned earlier means Messiah or uh, anointed one of God. That God has anointed this person for a specific purpose, which is to be the Messiah. And if you remember, they have been waiting for the Messiah. They have been waiting for this uh, anointed one for over 400 years. But when he, when Peter, when uh, his brother Andrew brings his brother Peter to Jesus, it says this, he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, son of a John. You should be called Cephas, which translates Peter. Now, when you get the English word, but it's, it says this, but in English, you miss something, which says, Jesus looked at him. This is more than just looking at him. This is looking at him in an analyzing way. It's a look of intention. Like he's looking at Peter, he's considering Peter. Almost like, as I was thinking about this, a man it's almost like he's considered the Peter who he is, and who he will be. Because right now, he's not a rock. Right now, he's going to go up and flow, and his motion sometimes carries him in a direction he doesn't want to go. He's bold to speak, you know, he's like, I'll step on water, and then he's sinking. Sometimes he's putting his foot in his mouth, he says, oh, I'll never leave you. And then later on, he does leave Jesus. And in fact, he denies Jesus three times. 
But it's almost like Peter, Jesus is looking at Peter, not just at who he was, but who Peter would become. And he's looking at this young fisherman and seeing how his life is going to be transformed. And he calls him Simon, son of John, and he changes his name. He's currently Simon, son of John, or Simeon, uh, 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 son of John. He says, that's who you were. That is your name. But now your name will be Peter or Cephas, which means rock. Both Peter and Cephas both mean rock. One's in Aramaic, one's in Greek. But it means Peter, a firm rock, a firm foundation. At some point, he would become a rock to the church. You notice later on, Peter would make that declaration. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church. And it's almost that he's saying, declaring that that declaration that Peter made, he would be the rock the church would be found on. And to some degree, Peter would lead the church for the first, uh, first generation. He would be the first among equals. And he would become a rock. In fact, when he would be tested, God, Jesus told him, you are going to be tested. Satan has requested you to, sift you to be sifted like sand. But when you, I have prayed for you and you will be victorious over it. But once you are conquered, once you have been restored, then go and strengthen your brother's faith. He would become that strong, firm, certain, steadfast, devoted foundation of the church. That when people want to know what a strong faith looked like, they would turn to Peter and say, look at his faith, how it stands firm. He would later on be a steadfast rock that when the Sanhedrin would say, stop preaching the name of Jesus, they would say, no, we will not. Is it better to listen to, to man or to God? We will listen to God. He would say, I would rather suffer for God's sake. And they celebrate for suffering for Jesus. He would become that firm rock. However, often in the gospel, the fun thing is you'll notice, it's a fun play in words, that when Peter would go back into his old habits, he'd go back into old nature, Jesus was calling Simon again. And when Peter was being a man who God's calling him to be, he would call him Peter. It's almost like whenever he would slip, Jesus says, are you going back to being Simon again? Or would you rather be Peter? And throughout Peter's life, Jesus would remind him, be the Peter I called you to be. And that's the character that God is calling us out to us to be. For us to be Peter, to be a rock in our faith. Are you a steadfast faith that God had called Peter? Could God call you Peter, a rock, a steadfast? And remember, he didn't happen overnight. It took many years in Peter's life, at least three years in Jesus' life, and beyond that, for him to come that salt rock foundation. And some of you in this church are a rock. There's some of you that people turn to you and say, yes, this person is a rock in my faith. If I want to know what a good God Christian life looks like, I turn to this person. And let me say this, beloved, God wants to turn you all into a rock, a foundation, a faith that was unmovable because Christ is working through you through the Holy Spirit. And God is looking for disciples that have a steadfast, devoted faith. But not only that, but then a sharing faith, a sharing faith. So in verse 43, on the next day, he desired to go into Galilee, and he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, Philip and Andrew are similar in a sense. As we talked about Philip earlier, and then the same with Andrew, both of them are people who quickly, as soon as they hear the gospel, as soon as they encounter Christ, they can't ha help but share their faith with others. Beloved, that's the kind of character that God wants. That when we see the gospel, when we hear God's word, when we see that it transform our life, that we're quickly to share it with others. 
that we don't just keep our faith to ourselves, but that we share it to our friends, family, and neighbor. Or maybe as you're reading your devotion this morning, or last night, or you're praying, that you, wow, God really put my, on my heart this person. And, and maybe you call them or talk to them, or you read a passage and like, oh, Lord, you're convicting me. I really need to get this area of my life in order. And, and you respond, or later on you say, you know, I was reading, maybe you're reading your devotion, and me and that do this, and then we read something in our devotion, and like, wow, that's so powerful. I need to share that with someone else. And you go share it with something else. Your faith is not private. Though the secular world, though the war around us say, you know, you Christians, as long as you keep it to yourself, we're fine with you. No, the, the Christian faith is a faith that is meant to be shared. Remember, Jesus told us, go through, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to keep all my commands. Christianity is a sharing faith, it is not a faith that you keep by yourself. Beloved, it. God is calling you to be just like Philip and Andrew, to as soon as you receive the gospel, as soon as you receive a word from God, from his word, that you share it to others because the world is in desperate need of the gospel and the truth to transform. Fourth and finally, a pure faith, a pure faith. Verse 46 says, And Nathanael said to him, Anything good come from Nazareth. And that, I mean, I know, I know we're so familiar, but it should be somewhat humorous. I mean, it may be someone might say, man, can anything come good from Dexter, Maine? I mean, really, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Does anything good come from there? You know, some of you feel that about Washington, D.C. Can anything come good from Washington, D.C.? That's how the, 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 this town was a bywater town out in the middle of nowhere and was right next to a Gentile city and they often work with the Gentiles and you know, Jews don't like Gentiles. How can this city be anything good? And to some degree, Nathaniel's asking a real question and you, when you hear it, you should kind of laugh or chuckle to yourself. Now, the, by the way, you th if you look in John, it's the only one that uses the name Nathaniel. Uh, what most scholars believe is that his secondary name is Bartholomew. And so his first name is Nathaniel, and most likely his last name is Bartholomew. Uh, and what it could be is Bartholomew could be son of Tamali. So Bar is no word for son of. So it could be Nathaniel, son of Tamali. But that's just the theory. Moving along, though. Uh, Philip then says, oh, let me see. Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. See for yourself. Now, just a side note, just think of it. When someone tells you the gospel and you, you tell them the gospel, you tell them, this, this is Jesus, let me tell you about him. The, I always don't want them to take it for my words myself because my words can be mistaken. I can make a mistake. I can have flaws. I want them to investigate the truth of the scripture themselves. I want them to open up the scriptures and read the gospel of John for yourself. I mean, and that's why when you go hear a pastor preach, you should show up with your Bibles open and read it. Because don't take my word for it. I know I even have it on the screen, but maybe I made a, a spelling error up there. You need to have your Bibles open and read it for yourself to verify what am I saying? Is it true or not? Um, I, I also, as me and Richard do with the youth, we're doing apologetics, and we, we talk about the evidence of historical evidence, manuscript evidence, archaeological evidence, and there's a lot of evidence for the Bible to be true. I don't want people to think it's true just because I say so, but because the Bible itself is proven a true, reliable, scriptural document. Verse 47 then says this, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said about him, Behold, I truly am Israel in whom there is no deceit. Again, just like John and Peter, 
Jesus kind of looks at Nathaniel. Ah, yes, I know you, Nathaniel. I know you very well, and I know what kind of character you are. You see, Jesus being sovereign because he's the son of God, he knew Nathaniel probably better than Nathaniel knew himself. And one thing he knew about Nathaniel, he had a pure faith. He had a pure faith. Not to say he's perfect, but unlike the law, the religious leader, he was not a hypocritical with his faith. He wasn't going to lie, cheat, or steal his way to the top. Nathaniel was, had a pure and holy faith. He desired a relationship with God. He desired to know God's word. There was no deceit in him that the person you saw Nathaniel to be on Sunday was who he was on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. That who he revealed himself to be, that was the authentic self. And in fact, if you saw him Sunday and you saw him Sunday night, he'd be the same person. That there was no difference. He is holy and pure in how he approached life. Like I said, it's not that he was perfect, but he lived a life seeking genuine faith with God. He was not rebelling to God. He's striving to find God. And may we all have that kind of pure faith. Now, he then says this, Nathaniel says this, as he, there's no deceit, and, and he says this in verse 48, he said, Nathaniel said to him, From where, where do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Phil called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. And Nathaniel answered, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Now, this is, this is really neat. There's, there's something that I think when Nathaniel, before Jesus showed up, Nathaniel was under this tree. And, and often, a lot of times when uh, Jews would pray, one of the places they would go would be underneath a tree to pray. There's a good chance he had uh, the pray, prayer thing around his arm. Maybe he has a phylactery on his head or he was having a, a moment with God. Maybe he was maybe reciting a psalm. And there, there's some sense that there's something happened that moment that was unique. He was maybe having a spiritual moment. Maybe he had a vision. Maybe he, he, he saw something about the Messiah. But there's something special. And no one else should have known about that prayer time. It would be almost like if uh, Annette was at home praying in, in her bedroom and no one else was there. No one else saw it. Joshua didn't see it. I didn't see it. No one else saw it. And then Jesus in the middle of the street came up to Annette and says, I saw you in your bedroom praying. How'd you know that? And so when Nathaniel sees Jesus says, I saw you there. I saw you praying. I saw you heart. I saw you desire. You desire to be holy and pure and devoted to me. I saw you. And he said, he realized, the only person who knows me, the only person that really, really knows who you are is Jesus Christ. The only one who really knows you is God. And so when he said, I saw you, he says, oh my it's God incarnate. It's the Son of God. No one else could have known about that fig tree. Maybe that was his, his special prayer spot. And as soon as he said that, he said, Rabbi. And he says, not only just a rabbi, not just a teacher, but you are the Son of God. Whoa, that's a big leap. But he, he realized only God would know, and the only person would know other than God is the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. He's already ready to crown him, put him in the king. He knows who he is. But we're something so simple. But I think there was just such an intimate relationship that Nathaniel had with God that when the, the Messiah showed up, he, he knew right away. No question about it. And by the way, there are some Christians that are like that, that you almost don't have to do anything to preach the gospel. They, they just naturally come to faith in God. And, in, and he had just such a pure faith. Now, Jesus then goes on and says this. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, 
I saw you under a fig tree. Do you believe? Really? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, you will see the heavens open up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This verse is amazing, and there's a few elements to this. First, it's like, wow, really, that's all you need to turn to faith? That was amazing? But you think that's amazing that I saw you under a fig tree. You want to see this amazing thing because you will see these this, the heavens open up and angels send and descend on the Son of Man. And there, there's, there's two things he's hinting at. The first thing, Son of Man. Where is that title, the Son of Man, come from? The book of Daniel. The, the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days. And, and God proclaims his rule and power, authority, that he's going to send this Son of Man with power and authority. And so there's, Jesus points to that, I am that Son of Man. But then this heavens ascending and descending, mind you, the, the ladder of Jacob, and then angels ascending and descending on that one place, and that God was in that place. What's Jesus saying here? Jesus is the ladder. Jesus is the bridge between heavens and earth. And he would bridge the gulf on that cross between man and heaven. He would be that great mediator. This is the great work he had come to do. And he is going to do that. And so as the, we look at these four uh, attitudes, the, the, the authentic faith, and the, the, um, the devoted faith, and the sharing faith, and the pure faith. Uh, this leads, this faith, it all comes out. And how do these characteristics come about? It comes about because Jesus' death on the cross, that, and through that death on the cross, and to put our faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, as he bridged the gulf between heaven and hell, that we can be redeemed, restored with heaven, with the Father, that we are transformed by the Holy Spirit. By through faith, we're transformed into the image of Christ. And therefore, these characteristics, God will work in us and transform us so we can have these characteristics. Now, I want to return back to a story before we conclude that relates to this. Mark Johnson was one of the hockey team members on that U.S. hockey team. Number 10. And he was actually the hockey player that in the right and the second court got the puck in on the Russian goalie that was supposed to be unstoppable. And he gets in and makes the score 2-2 two, two between the Russians. Amazing triumph. It was probably that moment that transformed the game because that rock up. Uh, a Russian hockey player would be thrown out. The U.S. would eventually win the gold medal and beat the Russians. They would go to the president of the United States and meet him in front of President Carter himself. And then later on, he would become a hockey NHA professional player. But, but, but while that all was happening, and though he had great triumphs and success, I was listening to his testimony. He felt empty. The cold business of the hockey team being traded from team to team, and no love or care. He realized he was missing and something in his life. And so one day, one of his teammates would meet with him and go through the scriptures and ask questions. And one day, with his friend, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he turned, he went from to the greatest hockey team in the world to the greatest team there is, which is God's kingdom, being a part of God's sin. He would become God's player and uses him in an amazing way. I was truly amazed that, that I, this is one of the stories I've got to learn this week. God wants to use you. He wants to put you on his team. 
And he wants to bring these characteristics in your life. And he will use it to transform you, to do amazing things for Christ and for his kingdom. And so all you have to do is surrender and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm a wretched sinner. I trust in your son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. He paid a debt. He paid for my sin. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Now use me. And when you do, you go from the, the, the team of this world to the kingdom of that world, to Jesus' team. And he will use you to do amazing things for his kingdom. And so let me finish off with this one quick thing. May we be followers of Jesus Christ to have authentic, devoted, sharing, pure faith. May we be used to transform the world for Christ and for his kingdom. Let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time as we go over. If you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. God bless you and have a good day. from